Hello, I'm Andrew McInerney, Artistic Director of the Studio de Musique Ancienne de Montréal, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce these pre-concert presentations for our special 45th anniversary season. Hi, Susie. How are you? <laughs> I'm very well, Dominique. <laughs> okay, so here I am with Susie Leblanc, and I will first introduce myself and let you talk about yourself a little bit later. So I am Dominique Lorty. I'm a musician, an instrumentalist, and I do play an instrument that is called the sackbut. Unfortunate name for yes. such a wonderful instrument, <laughs> I tell you. I have been really privileged to play with the studio de musique ancienne de Montréal called SMAM, uh, since 1984, mm. where we met, where we met for the first uh, time yes, in uh, this famous Vespers, Vespers Monteverdi Mont Vespers tour, exactly. absolutely yes. Well, I'm Suzy Leblanc. I'm a soprano, and I uh, teach at McGill early music. And I had also the the great pleasure of singing with Le Smam, as we called it, um, since 1979. Uh, that was my first uh, gig with Smam, and I continued to sing regularly for about five six years, and then came back often as a guest, as as my career took me to Europe. But I would love coming back and working with Christopher. It was always a great pleasure. Oh yes, and a great pleasure for. Her us to yeah. listen to you. Uh, oh my God. <laughs> so yes, it's no surprise that the concert this that celebrates SMAM is called No Chers Italiens, of course. Um, Italian music of that era, it's where everything happened. Uh, I mean, really, it's where all the innovation, the musical innovations of the time happened in Italy. Uh, the, the idea of, of um, music being linked to the words, to the stories that we're telling, uh, rather than just pure music, pure abstract music. And uh, it's interesting because the concert does go through that development in a way, because it begins with Palestrina, who was a little bit more of the old school, a really typical Renaissance church composer. He was the master of polyphony at the time, who wrote uh, more than a thousand masses, many, many motets, hundreds of motets, and who spent most of his active life at the Vatican, even though he had to leave the choir for the Pope changed and there was a rule that married men couldn't sing in the choir and he had to leave the Vatican and find employment elsewhere. But anyway, his wife passed away. He was very sad and he decided to become a priest. All this to say that he spent most of his life in the Vatican writing the most sublime sacred music. Um, and, and then we see later that we move on to composers that developed this link leading to the opera with with words and music uh so it's yes uh, they all had their they all had their little piece of yes. progress like like palestrina was the one who used the cantus firmus and then developed that into polyphony motets and yes. you know bits of motets and then we move on to Gabrielli. Gabrielli, yes, Giovanni Gabrielli, yes, who, who also innovated immensely. Right, you you should know much about Gabrielli being a sackbut player, because he writes for the sackbut, doesn't he? Yes, he does. <laughs> Finally, so um, yes, he was a Venetian composer, uh, Giovanni Gabrielli, and he was actually the nephew or of another Gabrielli called Andrea Gabrielli. Yes. So he learned he his uncle Andrea was his teacher. And also Orlando di Lasso. Mm. And uh, he was actually a very important composer. Um, to He actually is the one who is one of the ones, the, the first ones, making that, transitions be, that transition between Renaissance music and Baroque music in his use of the instrument. Mm. So before that, as you said yeah, before... Yeah, Palestrina was mostly vocal. Yes. Exactly. Yes. It was vocal music. It was music. The voice was close to the gods because it was God's instrument. Yes. And uh, then um, Gabrielli introduced the idea of inserting instruments amongst the voices. Mm -hmm. Like, for instance, this piece that we're going to be playing. Oh, Exaudi me domine. What a wonderful piece. Yes. In uh, four choirs, I yes, think. Yes, 16 Six, parts. Yeah, 16 yes. parts. So the interesting thing in there is that uh, the voice, if, depending on who they had available to play or sing, they could replace a voice by an instrument like the sackbut yes. or the cornetto. Yes. Very useful. Very useful. People exactly. get sick. All sorts of things can happen. Uh, yeah. All sorts of things can happen. And also, or double the voices if yes. you really want to make something you know, louder and bigger, you know? Yes. So, um, so this composer was very, very important at and he's also the first one who started writing dynamics. 
mm. in the part. Mm. Like, for, for instance, you have the Sonata Pianoforte, mm. where he actually writes where you have to play piano and then forte and then piano and then forte. He clarifies it. He I clarifies see. it. Okay. Before that, it was left to, you know, whoever, mm -hmm. whatever the words were saying. Mm -hmm. If it was hell, obviously it was very loud. And if it was, you know, the birth of Christ, then I guess it was... No right. trombones, perhaps? No sackbuts? I don't think it's the birth of Christ. <laughs> so what instruments did... Did he write, so there's Sackbut, but what other instruments did he write for? Um, it was not always spe specified, actually, uh -huh. because often you had, the parts were written for, um, sometimes it was specified, but not always. Yes. Because you could have uh, a dulcian, for instance, yes. playing a bass or a tenor yes. part. Um, cornetto? Cornetto. Well, cornetto is a fantastic instrument. And it has, we are very lucky in Montreal because we have this fantastic virtuoso, Matt Denijan, who will be playing in this ah, concert. Wonderful. And um, so the cornetto was an instrument that belongs to the Renaissance. Yes. It has nobody before, no instrument before. It's supposed to be to the, it. I said this sack, but imitates the voice, but the cornetto is supposed to be the one that imitated it the most perfectly, isn't it? I guess so. But I <laughs> That's guess, what they say. Yeah, but of course, the soprano voice, where if you go yes, lower, yes, then, then it's the sack, but then yes, it's the sack, but, of course. You know? yeah. And uh, yeah, and, and you know what? Actually, this is an interesting thing because uh, for SMAM, it was definitely a challenge at the beginning to find these people who could play these instruments or mm. even own the instruments. Mm. Like, for instance, the cornetto, let's come back to that. The cornetto, nobody was playing. Yeah. And you had, so you have one guy in France uh, who actually heard about it. Uh, or was encouraged by Régent Poirier really? to rediscover the cornetto. I didn't know to, that. Yes. And then there was Bruce Dickey. So that yes. was Jean-Pierre Cagnac yes. and there was Bruce Dickey in the States. Yes. And they both did, you know, and there was no internet in those days and there was no way for them to communicate and mm. do that. So mm. they did it individually mm. and they brought this instrument back to life. Yes. And now we have cornetists that yes. can play that music. But beautiful that ones. Definitely, yes. Uh, yeah. yes, definitely beautiful ones. Incredible. Yes. <laughs> And, and I mean, as we were saying, Gabrielli was also fantastic with the expression of the words. And in this piece that we'll hear, there's a lot of word painting. Uh, it, it, the music trembles when it's the word tremens. Yes. And, and when he's talking about the last judgment, all the 16 parts are playing very, very loudly. So it should be a very exciting performance. I mean, let's remember that it was performed first in St. Mark of Venice right. uh, in that acoustic it would have been incredible but it will be exciting in Saint Leon as well I'm sure oh yes yeah. it's a wonderful church to play in yes yes. so now the other composer mm. that obviously mm. I would love you to talk about mm. is Monteverdi because yes. he is he was definitely one of Christopher's favorite yes. and uh, and I think mine too so well he happens to be quite up there in my books as well uh Monteverdi, my goodness. I mean, in so many areas, he was an innovator. You know, I mean, he did pretty much is the, the first one to write an, an Italian opera with L'Orfeo, although there were some attempts before, but uh, also in the madrigals that he wrote. And I remember Christopher used to love this Orchel Cele la Terra that we used to do in, right. in a lot in the choir. And and Beatus Vier that would that, that uh, the SMAM is doing on the 3rd of November and the Gloria are pieces that we, I think, performed on tour when I did my first European tour. Those two pieces were there and they were done many times. But of course, they're not the only ones. I mean, you know, SMAM did a lot of the madrigals. As I was saying, Mondeverdi innovated in so many ways and he took this idea of expressing uh, the, each word by music to to such great lengths and and even further, mm. you have Stili Concitato that he invents uh, in the Combattimento di Tancredi. Just so many innovations, and uh, so prolific as well. So you couldn't possibly have the 45th anniversary without some Monteverdi in the concert. Yeah, and and I think that. Andrew chose two really beautiful and contrasting pieces. You know, the Gloria's obviously glorious, but, but um, what I find with Beatus Vir, it's just beautiful, you know, um, blessed is the one who, <clears throat> who fears the Lord. And the music is full of grace and compassion. And uh, it's just a very, very beautiful piece, uh, harmonically, uh, I think also very interesting. So mm. two contrasting pieces by Monteverdi in this. Wonderful. Yes. yes. And then... There's, of course, I don't know how to call it, but the great moment of the concert that we're all waiting for, in a way, is the Oratorio Barcarissimi, mm -hmm. uh, Jefte. Right. And uh, what a piece that is. What a piece. What a piece. And 
Giacomo Carissimi, also an Italian composer, but um, not a Venetian, Venetian one no. this time. He's more <clears throat> of the Roman, yes. the Roman school. <clears throat> and, you know, he's not very well known, actually. Uh, his life is not that well known. But you know, it's true. You know, it's also interesting. I couldn't believe it, but... Uh, he didn't publish in his lifetime, you know, compared to Palestrina, these other right. guys. He was, we only have music by Carissimi because it was copied out by his students. Exactly. This yeah. is amazing how lucky we are to have exactly. those. Exactly. Yeah. Thank God for students. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but, you know, he is basically the father of the oratorio. Yes. And the reason being is because he actually developed that recitatif, that notion of recitatif. So what is an oratorio? Basically, it's um, you have singers, you have soloists, I mean, then you have choir, and then you have this, um, like the historicus mm -hmm. in, um, in Jefte. The narrator. The narrator mm -hmm. that relates the story and just, you know, links it all up together. Yes. So he is... Also, very important uh, yes. composer. I think the idea of narrator before that time was often a spoken character in, in entertainments, right. but then it's really sung, it's really recitative. And he took that, actually, he took that from Monteverdi. Monteverdi had yes, started that, of course. of course. So he just went further ahead with that notion. And so he's a really good example of, and Jefte is a very good example of what an oratorio, uh, oratorio from the uh, early Baroque is Baroque is so Jefte Jefte that's an amazing piece yes. it's such um, uh, it's full of sounds and terror noise and, and it's so very much, theatrical so, yeah yes. it's so sad yes so we know the story of Jefte but I will no, still I'd like it if you could tell us yeah well, for those who forgot so I'll try to you know make it make a long story short. <laughs> so uh, Jefta started his life, I mean, he was an illegitimate child, illegitimate child, because his mother was actually a prostitute. So his brothers just, you know, shun him out of their the paternal house. So he is, you know, away, and he just gets a band of friends together, and uh, they decide to, um, to live, you know, in a very rough way with <laughs> the swords fighting and, uh, you know, a gang, basically. That's what you'd call them now, right? Gang of rebels. And um, so they are being at war with the, that's where the story starts. They're at war with the Ammonites. And uh, he really wants to win this war. So he makes a vow and he asks God, he prays God, and he says that he will sacrifice the first person that passes the threshold of his house mm. um, when if he wins the war. Mm. So God grants him his wish, and sadly, the first person is, is his you only need daughter. Only daughter. Yes. Who, by the way, doesn't have a name. No, it's true. Yeah. You know, I feel for this guy, Jeff, yeah. because I, I read, you know, one of the reasons why he really wants to win this war, it's because his brothers will take him back. And so it's like, you know, he's dying to be reunited with his family, yeah. wins the war, and then his he has to kill his his only daughter it has it, it's it's very tragic it's a very tragic story so, so her it, her story is tragic too but also yeah. his yeah but it's you know one of those stories that where they talk they're testing you know it's of like course. god of course. testing uh, yes. you know so it's always the same it's not always the same but it is there's a lot of that in in that story yes. Yes. and in um, the bible <laughs> yeah exactly in the bible so uh, so there again so what you have in here is really typical oratorio you have a, uh, a story from the ancient testament from the book of Judges mm. and uh, all put on music with the historicus actually which uh, varies sometimes it's in the soprano line sometimes in the uh, bass and, um, and it's very dramatic and, uh, I, and then you can divide it in two parts let's say there's mm -hmm. the beginning is very joyful it's mm -hmm. very lively and the winning of very, the war exactly and there they are and, and even the daughter is there singing you know victorious music for her father exactly yes. and then after that in the second part then it's very sad because you have and it ends with that very dramatic chorus one of the most beautiful beautiful chorus ever written I think the plorate yeah. it's very very it's exquisite. so poignant it, I mean, it's, it's, it's an your... amazing ending to the concert I think uh, people bring your Kleenex yeah exactly bring your Kleenex <laughs> you'll need them <laughs> 
And um, so, yeah, the poor daughter, she has to, uh, she has to spend a bit of time in the in the hills to yes. Um, to well, mourn she asks her. him. Eh? She asks her father, could she at least mourn her virginity for a couple of months? Exactly. Which obviously she won't lose, right? No, but she will die a virgin. That is true. That is true. But <laughs> but but no. Apparently, it's it's a very sad thing for Hebrew women of the time right. to to not have children, um, because. Each child that they bring into the world could be the Messiah. Mm -hmm. And she will not have that chance of maybe being the one who brings in the Messiah. That's true. Mm -hmm. And nor will she, there will be also no descendants of no. her lineage, her yes. family, you know. So there's a lot to bewail. Exactly. There's a yeah. lot. There's a lot. <laughs> and she bewails really beautifully, thanks to Kurosumi. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes. Kurosumi. I think Marie Magistri is, is singing Philia. So I look forward ah, to hearing her bewail. That would be wonderful. So... There we are. Yes, that ends that celebration of, of the Studio de Musique Ancienne, 45 years of music Five making. Years. 45 years of not only music making, but of um, giving Renaissance music its rightful place exactly. in Montreal. For me, it's, it's exquisite. Renaissance polyphony is, is just amazing. And, and the Studio de Musique Ancienne, or SMAM, is the only group that has always given it a very important place. We tend to look at more profane music and later music and the other uh, early music concerts and festivals in Montreal. And I think we have to support SMAM for that. We have to applaud it. And I mean, the best way to support it is by showing yes, up at the concert. Exactly. I will be there. I and, will be there. Yes, Actually, I, I'll be there playing too. Yes, you but, will. My God, you'll be on stage. But the and, wonderful thing also about Renaissance music that we have to... Um, realize is that the interesting part, which is the, the mixing up of instruments and mm -hmm. depending on who's there and what's not, the thing is that uh, you, you will have a piece, uh, the same piece, uh, interpreted by Christopher Jackson years past, and Andrew, they will both be beautiful, or somebody else, they will both be beautiful, but not the same, because they can choose. Mm -hmm. They can choose mm -hmm. what to do with it, depending yes. on how they, they see it. Yes. It is not predetermined a lot of exactly. creativity yes. exactly yes given to and the conductor so that yeah. is very interesting also because you could have you could have like 10 concerts of the same piece and it will sound different you know? so does that mean if we were there 45 years ago we have to go again yeah, exactly <laughs> exactly <laughs> okay well that's i'll see you there i will see you there susie <laughs> 